Hi, for this video what I want to do is show you how to run a two sample z-test for the difference between means and for this one I'm going to use a rejection region to help us make our decision as to whether we want to reject or fail to reject. Okay, so the situation that we have is a guidance counselor claims that the students in a college prep program have a higher mean ACT score than the students in the general program. 45 students who are randomly selected from the college prep program have a mean ACT score of 24.1 with a population standard deviation of 4.6. The mean ACT score of 42 randomly selected students from the general program is 20.2 with a population standard deviation of 5.2. At 5% level of significance, can you support the guidance counselor's claim? All right, so I told you that you're going to run a two sample Z test, but a lot of times you're not going to know which um, test to use until you start looking at the information that you're given. And depending upon your textbook, your conditions may be slightly different than the conditions that I have listed below. So if there are any different, make sure that you reference those. So the first thing that you want to ask yourself when you're dealing with two samples is, um, are the two groups independent? And we can say, the answer to this is yes. Being in a college prep program would be independent of the general program. Okay, the next condition that you need to ask yourself is, are they randomly selected? So it says um, for both of them that they did use random selection. So we can say yes, it states randomly selected. And depending upon your teacher or professor, um, some are okay with just listing out yes, 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 without like identifying all the information. And some of them want you to actually go through and write out um, in a sentence that um, each of the conditions are met. So make sure that you know, um, generally speaking, what your professor is looking for. Um, the next question is, do you know sigma 1 and sigma 2? Remember that sigma 1 and sigma 2 represent the population standard deviation for both of them. So for this one, since it says the population standard deviation is known, this would be sigma 1. And then this population standard deviation right here would be sigma 2. So we can say yes, it gives us both population standard deviations. If you know the sample standard deviation, then you would use the two sample um, t-test for independent samples. All right, and then the last question is, in order for the central limit theorem, remember that you have to deal with samples that are greater than or equal to 30, or you have to start with a normally distributed population. And in this case, we can say yes to both of these, because in one is 45 and in two is 42. So both of those are greater than 30. Um, so our sample size are good. Since all of the conditions are met, we can use a two sample Z test. It's always important to know which test you are running because there are different conditions for each test. So our next step would be to set up our null and our alternative hypothesis. And it's also important to identify which one is the claim and which one is not. Okay, so a guidance counselor claims that the students in a college prep program have a higher mean. So higher means greater than. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let mu1 represent the mean uh, the population mean standard deviation for the college prep students. And we're gonna say that mu1 is greater than mu2, where mu2 represents um, the general program. So it's important to either put in word form 
what you have or to identify which one is which so that whoever is looking at the test knows which one is sample one and which one is sample two. Okay, so since our claim was a statement of inequality, it's going to go in the alternative hypothesis. So we would say that mu1 is greater than mu2, and I'm going to write over here that mu1 represents the mean of the population of college prep students. And mu2 is going to be the mean of the population of general program students. Okay, that way everybody understands what um, sample or the first sample, what the one and the two represent. Okay, the Null hypothesis always has to have equality, and so it's going to be the complement of this. So instead of being greater than, it's going to be less than or equal to mu2. You could also just say that mu1 equals mu2. There are textbooks that just use equality for the null hypothesis, but your null hypothesis always has to contain a statement of equality. The other thing that's important to note about this part right here is that you could have also written it here as mu1 minus mu2 is equal to zero. This would say that there is no difference between the means, and this is going to be important in just a second when I go over the formula. Okay, so our next step is to actually go through, and we're going to write out all of our important information, draw our model, and then find our standardized test statistic. Remember for this one that z is found by doing the sample mean of the first um, so that would be the college prep, um, the sample mean of the second one. So the difference between those two minus mu1 minus mu2 over sigma1 squared over n1 plus sigma2 squared over n2. So in order to use this formula, we do have to find all of this information from the problem up above. So we're going to write out what is our x bar 1, what is our x bar 2, what is our sigma 1, what is our sigma 2, and n1 and n2. We just found n1 and n2 in our conditions, so we're going to say that n1 is 45 and n2 is 42. The others we will find from the problem itself. So up here it says that um, the mean ACT score is 24.1 for the college prep students with a population standard deviation of 4.6. So this would be our X bar 1. This would be sigma 1. The 20.2 would be our X bar 2 and the 5.2 would be our sigma 2. And then the other thing that we need is our alpha level. So this would be our alpha level. Okay, our alpha, alpha level is our level of significance. So let's go ahead and write those values down. X bar 1 is 24.1. X bar 2 is 20.2. Sigma 1 gives us 4.6. Sigma 2 is 5.2. And then we already wrote down N1 and N2. And then remember our alpha level is 0 0.05. So since we are using a rejection region, what we are going to do is we are going to sketch out a model of our rejection region. Okay. And in order to do that, we have to find our Z star or our Z naught, depending upon your textbook. Um, it may write it as Z star or Z naught, which is our critical value. And that's our value at the point that we would decide, are we going to reject or not? This is going to be our rejection region right here. Okay, and so we're going to find that value that starts the rejection region. The rejection region is just your alpha level, so it's shading the 5%. Okay, and the reason I knew it was a right tail was because of the alternative hypothesis. This will always tell you whether it's a right tail, a left tail, or a two tail. So if it's less than, it would be left tail. If it's not equal to, it would be two tail. So I'm going to go to a T table. 
And I know I said that I'm using a tea table. That's because the tea table makes it nice to find the rejection region. Um, because what you're going to do is you're going to open up your table and then we're going to look at um, the one tail. Okay, and we would find the one that they're talking about. So the one that they're talking about would be the 0 0.05 right here. Okay, and then we would go down that row all the way to the bottom to the infinity row. The infinity row is the z-scores, so these are all of our z-score formulas. Okay, and so since we're looking at this column, we would use the 1.645. If it was a left tail, we would put a negative in front of it. So basically what's going to happen is after we find z, if the value is greater than 1.645, then we will reject. If it is less than 1.645, then we fail to reject. So that's how we make our decision using a rejection region decision rule. Okay, so let's go ahead and plug our values into our formula. So we would have 24.1 minus 20.2. And then I'm gonna say this is really minus zero because of the fact that, remember, we're starting with there is no difference between the two. Okay, so technically I don't even have to write that. I'm gonna get rid of the zero. Okay, um, this part right here is zero because we're starting with there is no zero, there is no difference. If it said that the difference was one or the difference was two, then we would add a different value here. But as long as you're starting with there is no difference, that they're equal to each other, um, then we would put in a zero for this part. Okay, and then sigma one, we would put in 4.6 squared divided by 45 plus sigma two squared, which is 5.2 divided by 42. And then you would put this into your calculator. So as long as you put it into your calculator exactly as I have it here, where you put parentheses around the top part, 24.1 minus 20.2 in parentheses divided by, and then make sure that this entire denominator is underneath the square root. So either that's with parentheses or sometimes in your calculator, whatever your calculator is. I'm not gonna show you how to plug it into the calculator. Um, I already did that, but the Z ends up being 3.695. I advise plugging it in exactly as it is rather than trying to find independently each part because if you round within that, the more times you round, the further off your result is going to be. So our Z ends up being 3.695, which is definitely to the right of this value here. It's definitely in the rejection region. So this is in the rejection region. So our conclusion is going to be that we are going to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so if it's in the rejection region, you reject. If it's not in the rejection region, then you fail to reject. And then the last step always is to go through and write an interpretation of your findings. Okay, um, it is important to include the alpha level. So we can say at 5%, there is, and this is extremely strong because remember that anything above two is considered unusual, above three is extremely unusual. So at 5%, there is enough evidence. Sorry, can't talk and write at the same time. There is enough evidence to support because our claim was about the alternative, we're supporting our claim. Um, if it was about the null hypothesis, we would be rejecting the claim. Okay, so there is enough evidence to support the guidance counselor's claim. And you must have context in your interpretation. that the mean ACT for college prep students is higher than the mean
ACT score for the general program. Okay, it's always really important that you include an interpretation of your findings because for the most part, people don't understand statistics, but they could understand something like this. They could say that, oh, I get it. We have enough evidence to support the claim that the mean ACT score for college prep students is higher than the mean ACT score for the general program. Okay, and this ends up being really strong evidence because like I said, 3.695, will almost, you'll never get a z-score like that usually by just chance alone. So it's very unlikely for this to have occurred just by chance alone if there were no difference to start out with. I know that this is a very lengthy process, but I wanted to go through the entire thing with you so that you know how to run it from start to finish. As always, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know. If there are additional topics you need me to cover, please let me know that as well.